Take it to church, put your hands to the Lord. Having some technical difficulties. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Amen. <laughs>
joy should be. And this joy that we have, no one can take away. Hallelujah. Let's lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Give him all the glory, Lord, our church. Thank you. 
shut the Holy Spirit down. Listen, you cry out to God and he will show up. Amen. Oh my gosh, God is greater than anything going on. Listen, you feel stressed, you feel scared, you feel vexed, you speak in tongues and you cry out to God. <laughs> Let me tell you, you lead this place shot in victory, winning Amen. somebody, praying for somebody to get healed. Come on Amen. Hallelujah. And so we just want to pray for our nation. Amen. We want to pray for an outpouring of God's spirit. We want to yes. pray for a great awakening. That's what we need above everything else. Yes. We need Jesus. Yes, amen. Greater than politics, anything else going on. Listen, when God is in control, things happen. Yes. And so that's what we need. And so we want to pray for that. We want to pray for our mother church, Tucson. Pray for the leadership here. Pray for all the surrounding churches, all the pastors that God would help them during this time. Continue to be fruitful. Amen. And so uh, let's just all pray together and believe God for this service. Listen, if you need God, you say, God, I came here expecting to hear from you. I came here expecting to receive direction, deliverance, wholeness, whatever it is. Because the Bible says that if you believe, all things are possible. If you believe that God wants to help you tonight, God will help you. So let us pray together. Let us lift up this service. Father, we just thank you. God, we put this service into your hand. We ask you to move by your Holy Spirit. God, we ask you to touch and change. Lord. We ask you to bring salvation and deliverance. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. 
have your way move sovereignly, oh God. I pray that you would inspire, that you would help, that you would bring joy and peace in the midst of any situation. Father, we thank you for the wonderful things you're going to do tonight. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, church. Why don't you take a moment to say hello, amen, to your neighbor. Welcome them out. We want to welcome everybody that is here this night. Thank you for those that are watching on live stream. Amen. You can take your seats, everybody. Hallelujah. The only announcement is revival. Amen. We are in revival through Sunday. Don't be afraid. God is greater than everything else going on. Amen. The, the word of God and the church of God and the kingdom of God will always power forward. Amen. So hallelujah. With that in mind, amen, I want to read a quick little story. This is, this is the story told of a woman who had finished shopping and returned to her car. And she found four men inside her car. She dropped her shopping bags, drew a very large handgun and screamed, I have a gun and I know how to use it to get out of the car. <laughs> Those men did not wait for a second invitation. They got out and ran like crazy. The woman, somewhat shaken, loaded her shopping bags and then got into the car. But no matter how hard she tried, she could not get the key into the ignition. Then it dawned on her. Her car was parked four spaces away. <laughs> she loaded her grocery bags into her own car, then drove to the police station and turned herself in. The desk sergeant, whom she told the story, nearly fell off his chair laughing. He pointed to the other end of the counter where four men were reporting a carjacking by an old woman with thick glasses, curly white hair, less than five feet tall, carrying a very large handgun. No charges were filed. You see, she thought the car was hers. But it really belonged to somebody else. We think our lives and our finances really belong to us but they truly belong to God. Your life is in God's hands. Amen. Everything that you have, every blessing is from God. And so we want to honor God for all that he has done for us and all that he gives us ushers. Why don't you come forward? If you want to write a check, please make it to the door church. You're watching online. You can give at the doorsd.com. We have an app there right on the website and you can give through there. There's a place for love offering that will go directly to Pastor Wilkins. Everything you give tonight, amen, um, will go directly to Pastor Wilkins. If it's your tithe, that will be tithe. But anything else will be dedicated for Pastor James Wilkins. But you make the check to the door, and we will write one check for him. And I want to say thank you, church, for always being so faithful in all that you do. And you're always so giving, and we so appreciate it. Fidel, why don't you pray for the offering? Thank you for uh, November. Thank you for the offers and the givers tonight, God. And those who uh, give tonight, we thank you in Jesus' name, God, throughout this revival. You give us words, God, amen. In Jesus' name, do season to each individual in this place, God. Speak to us, help us generate that inside of us, and work it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church, and thank you for your faithfulness. And it is a tradition to have him here. And so let's welcome Pastor Wilkins. Amen. Good to see everybody here tonight. Appreciate you being here. Um, I know some of you is all you can do to get here. Amen. Uh, we, we believe in God for just a great weekend. And, uh, and really want to get the mind of God for what he 
have us say this uh, this weekend of revival. And so uh, you pray that God will move and have his way yes. and, um, and minister. I want you to turn in your Bible this evening, if you would, to the, the Gospel of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Sometime back, this was probably a couple of years ago, a friend of mine called me. Uh, he had been going through some, just some financial stress. They were kind of under the gun. And uh, he, he called me to ask me to pray for him. He said, hey, James, listen, man. He says, I've got my annual review from our job coming up. And he said, listen, I want you to pray for me. He said, man, we really need a miracle. He said, I need way more money. And he said, in times past, you know, they've given us a little bit. He goes, but man, I need something substantial. And I remember, I said, so, so, so how much are we praying for? He says, listen, man, I need like $4 an hour raise. Amen. I said, okay, let's pray. We prayed right then and there over the phone. And we hung up the phone, and, and I hung up with these words, hey, I'm going to be praying. Let me know. And so we hung the phone up, uh, and a few days later goes by, he calls me, uh, and when I pick up the phone, uh, I can tell by his voice that he's not enthused. <laughs> I say, hey, how are you doing? He says, this is going all right. I said, so, so what happened? He said, yeah, man, I just got my review, and, and you know what? Uh, uh, they gave me a dollar an hour raise. And so I was like, hey, a dollar an hour is better than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said, hey, you got to be encouraged. He said, man, yeah, but I really need more, man. We, we, we need more. And so I said to him, I said, why don't you go and ask for more? Come yeah. on now. That's right. And he looked at me, and, and he responded, the way you're looking at me right now. <laughs> Girl. And so he goes, no, I don't think I can do that. I said, listen, what could it hurt? Yeah. I mean, the worst they can say is no. He said, well, what if I lose my job? I said, okay, that's worse. Go ahead. <laughs> and so I remember just kind of encouraging him. He was kind of uncertain. I said, listen, just do it, man. Just do it. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it right now. He's at his job. He hangs the phone up. But, and so he goes into his boss's office. He says he, he knocks on the door a little bit uncertain. The boss looks up from his busy work and, and beckons him. And he comes in. And, and, and he kind of closes the door after me. He says, um... You know, I appreciate the, 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 the raise that I got yesterday, you know, the dollar hour. Uh, um, he said, but you know, I, I was wondering, is there any possible way I could get more? And he said his boss looked up at him. Like, what in the world, more? <laughs> and he said, listen, I, I, I'm just asking this. I'm not trying to, you know, just, just be rude or, or unappreciative. And the boss looked at him and says, listen, it's been a very difficult year. He said, as a matter of fact, we didn't even give everybody a raise. We gave you a dollar more because we value you. We, we appreciate all that you've done, your contribution. And he kind of, he says, I just feel like I, could, I, could, I really need more. And so his boss says, you know what, I tell you what, let me come back. He gets up, he leaves the office, he comes back and he says, tell you what, we're going to give you $2 an hour. And so he thanked him. He leaves the office. He goes up, out to his car and he calls me. He said, I just talked to my boss and, and they're going to give me $2 more. I said, well, praise God. I said, hey, hey but remember, we prayed for four. <laughs> and he goes, no, man. I said, hey, hey, why are you asking? You might as well ask all the way. <laughs> Amen. And so sure enough, he goes into his boss's office and the boss looks at him this time like, okay, what, what, you know, he said, you know, I know this seems weird, <laughs> and I know it seems like I don't appreciate, but, but I do. He says, but, but, and you know what? He said, he just began to tell his boss and keep it real with him. He said, I've been on this job for 20 plus years. He said, I've got so much sick time accumulated. I never take time off. I'm always the first one here. He goes, I pray for this job. I pray for this company. And he goes, this company has made millions of dollars because of my labors and because of my prayers. 
Amen. He said, listen, I, I feel like I'm not stretching by asking you for more. And his boss looks at him in complete disbelief. <laughs> and he says his boss gets up and goes out of the office, and he sits in the office for like 10 minutes all by himself. <laughs> the boss comes back in, closes the door, gets behind his desk and looks at him and says, listen, I don't want you to speak of this to anyone. We've decided we will give you $4 more an hour. Wow. Amen. Amen. He thanked him. He walked out of the office. He gave me a call. Listen, I couldn't even understand. He was he was screaming and yelling and was so overjoyed. Amen. I want to preach a message this evening called Give and Take. And I want to look with you in Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 5. We're going to read through verse 9. The Bible says, he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give it because he is his friend. Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. One of the characteristics about God is that God is a giver. Yes. Amen. The cornerstone text of scripture we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave. Every one of us in this building we are recipients of God's liberality. Amen. God's given to us again and again. He's given us what money can't buy. Amen. He's done things in our lives that we're still amazed by. We're doing things we should never be doing. We're going places we should never go. We're experiencing things that we don't even deserve because God is so liberal. God is a giver. Yes. Because he's a giver, we know all too well we can take this microphone one by one and share testimonies of, of how God has blessed us. There was a young man in the Tucson church years ago, and every time you greeted him, he would always answer, like, hey, how you doing? He would always say, better than I deserve. <laughs> we used to mock him like, hey, how you doing? Better than I deserve. He would always say it. But if you think about it, that's all of our answers now. Yeah. I could go to each of you. How are you doing? Better than I deserve that. Yeah. Because we all have received so much of, of God. Uh, and, and all that we hope to be and all that we believe in is a result of God who freely gives. When you look at the children of Israel, they were slaves. There were generations of slavery. I say all the time, if you went to their slave quarters, if, if, if I could use that term, and if they had pictures on the wall, you'd see a picture of, of, a, of an old man. Who's that? That's my great, great grandfather. Really, he was a slave. Well, who's that? That's my, that's my great grandfather. He was a slave too. Oh, and that's my granddaddy. He was a slave. Oh, and that's us, man. You know, we're slaves. <laughs> and those are our kids. They're going to be slaves. And their kids are going to be slaves. And what you start to see is as far as they look back in their past to as far as they look to their future, all they hoped for was slavery. Come on. They laid their head on the pillow one night and woke up free. Come on now. God gave them freedom. God did that. There's nothing they did. All they did was slept. And God gave them freedom. Why? Because God is a giver. When you've been a slave so long, you ain't got nothing. And so not only did God give them freedom, God gave them wealth. They, they plundered Egypt, and they left Egypt with all sorts of resources and wealth and money and all sorts of things. And so not only did God give them freedom, God gave them wealth. God says, listen, I, I'm going to be a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I'm going to show you. I'm going to be your GPS. I'm going to give you direction. Why? Because God's a giver. They got to the Red Sea and they looked back and Pharaoh was chasing them. And God gave them victory over Pharaoh. God gave and gave and gave. He gave them manna from heaven. He 
gave them water from a rock. He gave them city passage all the way to the promised land. And when they got to the edge of the promised land, God says, hey, go take the land. And they couldn't take it. They had become so good at receiving that when it came time for them to take something, they didn't even have the capacity to do it. And herein is our dilemma. We've all become good at receiving. But listen to me very closely. If we're going to experience all that God has for us, there has to be some take in us. Yes. Every single one of us. Amen. See, when you read this text of scripture and you see these people, man, they're standing on the edge of the promised land. They've seen grapes the size of, of a small baby. They know that the land is a land that flows with milk and honey. They know that God's word is true. But an entire generation died outside of the, outside of the promised land, never ever experiencing all that God had. Why? And you look at them and you shake your head like, my days. What's wrong with them? Same thing wrong with us. <laughs> we become good at receiving, but sometimes we lose the capacity to take. In Matthew eleven twelve, 12, there's a scripture that says, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Amen. In other words, there are things that you're only going to receive if you have some fight in you yeah. and the willingness to arise and take yes. I remember years ago I was living with some single guys in the church, there was probably about 10 of us in a, in a four bedroom house and I was like, nasty man <laughs> <laughs> and so we're living there and, and, and Fred Ruby who, who was kind of in charge of the house, uh, I had just moved in, we're sitting in the living room and, and he says, hey so James what do you think God has for you, do you think you're going to preach the gospel and I said, man, Fred, you know, it's all good, but I don't even know, man. I'm just going to you know, just enjoy this salvation, man, see what happens. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he goes, wow, I guess you'll never preach. And he got up and walked out of the room. <laughs> and I was like, what's that all about? <laughs> but as I began to live life, I started to understand what he was trying to relate to me. There's a story in the Bible of a man named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet, and God says, Elijah, I want you to anoint Elisha. He's going to take your place. And so the Bible says these words in 1 Kings 19, 19, and 20. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? So God says, I want you to find Elijah and anoint him. And he finds Elijah. Elijah's working in the field, and he's sweating. He's plowing with oxen, and he's laboring. And Elijah walks past him and takes the mantle of God and throws it on him and just keeps walking. As soon as the mantle hits Elijah, he knows what that means. And so the Bible says he runs out to the man of God. Hey, wait, 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 you can't work for a mantle and the anointing. He says, God has given that to you. You have received that. But what he's saying is, what else happens from this point on has everything to do with what you do and the decisions you make. Yeah. And whether or not you're going to take what's yours. Yeah. And that is the same word that God is speaking. And the reason I'm preaching this is because there's a false doctrine that we've all you know, kind of believe from time to time. And that false doctrine is this. If it's the will of God, yep, that's right. God will make it happen. Yep. We always hear that. I mean, they curse me, they made this. All right, that's, it's God's will, God will make it happen. But that's not necessarily true. And the reason I'm preaching this is because there's a mindset that, that we have where, whereas we, we, we begin to view conflict and struggle as signs that it's not the will of God. Mm. Come on. 
But that's not true. That's right. There's conflict and there's struggle right in the middle of the will of God. Yeah. Rebecca was barren and she and she prayed, God, give me a child. Please, God, give me a child. I want to give birth to a child. And God gave her a child. She became pregnant. And the Bible says in Genesis 25 that she said these words, God, if it be so, why am I thus? She goes, God, if I'm in your will, if this is your will, why am I going through all this? Why is all this struggle? That's the prayer we always pray. God, why is it so hard? God, I'm just trying to do right, man. Why is it so difficult? And so many times... This is our cry, God, if it's your will, why is it so difficult? See, our thinking sometimes isn't right. Because we have to learn how to receive what God gives. But we also have to begin to be takers. Yeah. When Jesus looked at his disciples early on in the ministry, he said, listen, I'm going to send you two by two to every city. He said, I'm going to send you. And listen, when you go, don't even take your wallet. Don't, don't take a change of clothes. Leave your American Express card at home. <laughs> Amen. He says, every city you go in, people are going to give you some. Listen, they're going to give you a place to stay. They're going to give you food. He says, everything's going to be taken care of. All you have to do is go in my name and receive what's given you. Amen. And they did that. And they came back and they were like, man, God. They hooked me up. Man, I had to even do this. I went to the city. And man, they had it all. It was so good. They're, they're blessed. But before Jesus leaves them, he pulls his disciples together. And, 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 and Luke, he, he begins to say the exact same thing in a different way. He says, in Luke 22, 35 and 36, he says, remember when I sent you without person stripped and shoes? He goes, did you like anything? He said, nothing more. Then he said unto him, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his strip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his clothes and buy a sword. Mm. In other words, Jesus is saying, okay, remember when I sent you out, you didn't have to worry about everything that was given you? Oh, yeah, I remember that was a lot. He said, listen, the dynamics have changed now. He said, now you take your wallet, you get your credit in order, you do everything you can, take change of clothes. Hey, you got a sword? You got a sword. Listen, sell your clothes and buy a weapon. Well, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, you're going to enter into a dispensation yeah. that's going to require some fight. Yeah. That's going to require some tenacity. In other words, everywhere you go now, it's not going to just be given to you. You're going to have to have some take in you. And it's so true. Uh, listen, and the question is, why do we have to take what's already given to us? I mean, if God wants to give me a, a well, why, why do I have to take it? Why can't I just wait on God to give it to me? It's an interesting text of scripture. The children of Israel didn't go into the promised land. The Bible says God let them walk in circles for 40 years in the, in the wilderness until all of them died. And then they get back to the promised land again. And listen to what God says to Joshua. Joshua 1 11, he says, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan. Listen to what he says. You're going to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. Come on. Now, now listen up. He says, listen up. You're going to go in and take the land. You're going to take the land that God gave you to take. Hmm. Wait, wait, time out, time out, wait. If God gave it to me, why do I got to take it? Because there's a lot of things in life that God has given you. Amen. But you'll only receive it and experience it if you have some take in you. See, hear what I'm saying very closely tonight. God is a God that opens doors. But God is also a God that gives you the strength to open closed doors. Come on. See, we always pray God open doors of opportunity for me, Lord. To, and what happens is, is, is we become so single-minded looking for doors that are open. But there's some doors that are closed you're going to have to push open. Hmm. Come on. That's right. And this is why I'm preaching this. In my Christianity, man, hey, there's been some powerful open doors. Hmm. There's been a lot of doors I had to push open. Come on. And so with you tonight. 
We're all the same. See, in our text of scripture, he says there's a friend that comes at midnight. He said, listen, man, a friend's at home, and he has some, some, some friends of his come, and man, we're passing through. He's like, God, man, I ain't even got no food to, to give y'all. I ain't got no bread. He said, listen, come on in, so I'm going to my neighbor's house. And it's midnight. He goes to his neighbor's. <laughs> you ever heard that knock late at night? Like, <laughs> right away, like, the world's knocking on my door. <laughs> And the Bible says, hey, his friend goes, hey, Joe, man, it's me. And I got some friends, man, that came by the house, man. I ain't got no bread, man. Hook a brother up, man. He says, I can't, I can't, I can't help you, man. And he goes, we're all in bed. My kids are all asleep, man. Me and my wife in bed. I can't listen. I'll hook you up tomorrow. See, in biblical days, they didn't have no four-bedroom houses. They all slept in one bed. You know how hard it is sometimes to get some kids to sleep, man. <laughs> sometimes the kids are finally asleep, man. You know, Junior, man, he hears everything. And if he wakes up, man, we ain't none of us gonna sleep the rest of the night. <laughs> so, man, listen, man. Look, I'm not gonna do it so hard for my kids to sleep, man. I can't, I can't get up. If I get up, everybody's gonna wake up. I'll look you up tomorrow, friend. <laughs> There's a pause. And then, <laughs> now listen, right away you're like, no bro, you can't understand what I said. <laughs> right? Yeah. He knocks again. And this is the question I have. At what point did he stop asking and start taking? Because the first knock, I can't give you no bread, man. I'll hook you up tomorrow. He stands there. The second knock means, hey, I ain't asking no more. <laughs> you get some bread up in the house, bro. Be up, man. And so all of a sudden, he goes from asking to taking. And the Bible says, with his persistence, he walks back to his house with bread in his hand. <laughs> My days. Why? <laughs> ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. This is what he's trying to say. You have to push open some doors. See, there are people, you're stuck right now outside of a door that's closed. And you're praying, God, please open this door. Man, man, listen, I'm, I'm a fast every Tuesday now for the next couple of weeks until God moves. Man, I'm praying, man. I can feel it. God's going to do something. And you fast and pray. And you fast and pray. And nothing happens. Oh, God, open this door. And all you have to do sometimes is just push. Amen. See, God can open doors. There's a scripture in the Bible in Acts 12, 8 through 10. Look at what it says. Here's the disciple. He's in prison. He's in chain. He's about to die. He's locked in, in between soldiers. And the Bible says, the angel said unto him, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. He said, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that heads into the city and it opened all by itself. Did you hear that? He's in prison, sleeping, and the angel, wake up, man. You know, he's, he's groggy, he's like, am I seeing a vision? He said, put your clothes on, let's go. And the Bible says they went past the first guard post, they had to push that door open. Then they went past the second, they had to push that door open. And then when they got to the third door, that door opened all by itself. They had to push two doors to get to the door that was already open. Mm. Are you hearing me tonight? Amen. There's open doors that God has made available to us. Come on. Amen. But because it's going to take a struggle and a little bit of conflict and a little bit of difficulty, what happens is, is we sit outside of closed doors waiting for God to give us everything. Yeah. 
David came to visit his brothers. He said, how you guys doing, man? How's the war? Yeah, dad told me to bring some lunch to you. And why is there? Goliath comes out. Big old monster. He's cut. I probably had an eight pack, man. That was no joke, man. He said, send me out a man. David, who is that? He says, Goliath, man. He said, man, please. Man, he's cursing God. That's wrong, man. I'll fight him. That's right. He's supposed to come on, David. What is he? Thank you, know everything, man. Man, why don't you go back and watch them sheep, man? You come here, bring us lunch. You don't know nothing about war, man. Why don't you leave this up to us? He's looking at a hundred plus thousands of men, seasoned warriors. They got scars. They're battle ready. You don't even know what's happening here, man. Listen, we're praying, man. God's going to give us the victory, man. I mean, we're, we're praying and fasting, man. Don't worry, God's going to fight for us. <laughs> and David's like, hey, man, I'll go out there and fight him right now. Man, listen, you don't even, man, please. So while they're praying and waiting for God to open the door, <clears throat> David gets five smooth stones and goes out there in no man's land. And all he does is close his eyes and throw a rock. <laughs> <laughs> he just pushes, and guess what? The door opens, there's victory. Man. So the question is, how long would they have waited? They would have waited and prayed and waited and prayed and waited and prayed and went home and said, well, we didn't get the victory. But thank God for a young 11-year-old boy that all he did was push. And all he, once he pushed all these open doors that were on the other side of this conflict, they experienced a powerful victory. See, we have to have some taking us. The violent take it by force. Yes. Here's blind Bartimaeus. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus is on the, on the roadside. He's a beggar. He can hear people walking by. He can hear a large crowd. He's like, man, what's going on? He said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And blind Bartimaeus, he wants his sight. And, and so, so, so he, he has to make a decision. So he calls out, Jesus, have mercy on me. I mean, just throw it out there. You never know what happened. And the Bible says the people turned to him and says, man, be quiet, blind bottom man. She ain't got no time for you. <laughs> he makes the crowd angry. I've said before, listen, when you're a blind beggar and you got a crowd, the last thing you want to do is make a man, right? Right. <laughs> they will go and take the money you do have in your pocket. Amen. <laughs> Listen, man, here's an opportunity to make so much money. You know? And so he's got a choice. And so he said, listen, hey, I don't even care. And the Bible says he read, Jesus! Come on. And Jesus stopped. The first time he asked, nothing happened. Blind Bartimaeus had some take in him. He said, man, listen, he's a miracle working God. I need a miracle. See, listen to me tonight. Can you take Remember the, 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 the woman that, that followed Jesus for days? You can read this in Matthew chapter 15, the Canaanite woman. She, she follows Jesus for days and she's got a demonized daughter. And everywhere Jesus goes, she, they look back, there's that woman again. Jesus, have okay. And the disciples say, Jesus, man, let's, let's deal with her, man. She's getting on our nerves, right? <laughs> she's been following for days. And so finally, Jesus turns and looks at her. Can you imagine how she must have felt? Finally, I got his attention. Right? He goes, what, what do you mean? She goes, my, my, my daughter, please. I know a parent, man, they don't do anything to your kids. My daughter, Lord. And Jesus says, no, listen, I, I'm, I'm not set for you. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm set for the Jews. So, so right away, he started talking about race, right? All right, you want to pull that on me? <laughs> then he says, you know what, as a matter of fact, listen, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. <coughs> Every one of us in this room, we would have walked away, wouldn't we? Come on, come on. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been on Yelp as we walked. <laughs> <laughs> we start reading. We tell the whole world, I tried that, Jesus. Man, you know what he told me? He called me a dog. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. And this woman said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. 
Y'all! And the Bible says, she's like, woo! That's a serious sister right here. And he gives her a blank check. Jesus said, listen, no, I can't give it to the dog. She said, mm. oh, I think, Jesus, did you think I was asking? No, oh, I'm taking here. <laughs> and by faith, she realized here's an opportunity of a lifetime. And she walks away with her daughter completely healed and made yes, whole. Amen. Why? Because she had some taken her. Amen. See, hear me tonight. What I'm speaking of is very real and it's very true. I can go to story after story after story in the Bible. About five months ago, six months ago, I live in Northern California. So, so sometimes I do work in San Fran. So, so I don't really like going down there because it's just, you know, parking and, you know. So, so I had this job in San Francisco. So I, I drive down there. I'm in traffic for two hours. And, you know, and it's only like 25 miles from my house. <laughs> and so it's insane. So I finally found a place to park. I've got my little trolley because, you know, when you're in the city, sometimes you're going to park like four or five blocks. Sure enough, I'm like five blocks away. And so when I leave my house, it's sunny. By the time I get to San Francisco, it's raining. So, you know, I, I put my tools up, and, you know, it's raining, and I'm walking through the, the, the sidewalks, and, and, you know, you're trying to stay close to the buildings where the overhang is, so, so you don't get wet, right? And I get to this building where I'm supposed to work, and, and, and the door is shut, the lights are out. And so, 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 you know, I, 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 the door is locked, I, I push it a little bit, so, so, I knock on the door, and nothing. And so, it, it's pouring on soap now. And you know, I don't know why you move around. To, you know, the rain's still here. So I'm moving around like, man, open the door, man. So I'm knocking on the door. And so I'm trying to stay under that little overhang. But the problem is, is it's those big drops that hit me right in my neck, you know. And so I'm like, ah. And, and so I'm waiting, and it's like five minutes go by. I call, and my phone's all wet. And then as I'm waiting, this car pulls up. It's a Tesla, right? And it pulls up on the curb. The water splashes, I move back, and the back door opens. And this skinny leg comes out, right? <laughs> and he has some live shoes on, right? And, 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 and he puts his foot like he's looking for a, a, a solid place. And he puts his foot in, then the next leg comes out. Then the driver walks around and helps this older man out of the car. Mm. He brings his walker. And so he, he gets on the curb, and he kind of gets his balance and, and straightens up a little bit, and then he starts walking to the door. And so he comes, and he's walking, and I say, hey, hey, I, I've been here, I've been knocking, you know? He just ignores me. Mm. He goes to the door, and he takes his walking, and pushes it, and the door opens. And he's walking <laughs> right <around. laughs> You ever been so embarrassed <laughs> that you look around and see him saw you? <laughs> and I walked in after him, soaking wet. There's some of you frustrated, vexed at God. Waiting for God to open the door. And all you gotta do is push. All you gotta do is push. And the door will open to you. The lepers in the Old Testament says, Why are we gonna sit here and wait and die? The one talent man, when the day of reckoning, he says, Here, Lord, this, this is what you gave me. You mean to tell me you lived your life only just experience what was given? You never tried to, you know, push your doors and believe God. Mm -hmm. See, what happens is we become disgruntled. If we're not careful, we become like the, the older brother. Remember the prodigal son? He had a brother. Prodigal, he, he takes his inheritance, he goes out, to, and you know the Bible says he wastes a riotous living. Wastes his money, man, on all sorts of things. And he finds himself in a pig pen. Pigs. You ever been to a pig pit? Pigs are nasty. Amen. He's feeding pig slop. And the Bible says he's so hungry that he's looking at this nasty stuff. You know, pig slop is just fermented, nasty food. Come on. I mean, you can smell it a mile away. And he's slushing that stuff. But he's so hungry, he's so low in life that he wants to eat what he's giving the pigs. Mm. He's looking at it like, put, put a little bit of chalula on that, man. Hey. <laughs> I mean, he's desperate, man. And the Bible says he comes to himself. 
And he goes all the way back to his father's house. And, and his father receives him. I mean, it's so wonderful. Then they have a celebration. And, and so his older brother is coming back to the house. He's been working all day in the field. And, and before he gets to the house, he can hear the commotion. The whole atmosphere on the ranch has changed. Everybody's happy. He's, he's walking up. He's like, man, he hears the music. What's going on, man? Maybe one of the workers runs by. Hey, hey what's happening? Hey, man, your brother. Your brother just came home. Whoop, we're going to have a party tonight. The Bible says he gets mad. Pardon. Yeah, yeah, we killed the fatted cat. <laughs> <laughs> he's so mad that he won't even go into the party. And the father, his son's back, he's enjoying the festivities, but the father is still mindful that his older, his oldest son isn't here, isn't there. I mean, that's like God. Yeah. God is never too preoccupied to, to not notice us. That's right. That's a whole different sermon. And so he, he leaves the house and goes searching for his, his oldest son. And he finds him. He says, son, what are you doing? Come on, let's go in. Man, your brother's back. He's so mad that he won't even call him his brother. He calls him your son. Come on. Listen to what he says in Luke 15, 28 through 31. He says, he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I served you. I didn't transgress your law at any time. I obeyed your commandments. Listen to these words. Yet you never gave me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harvest, thou was killed from the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is yours. Did you hear that? Amen. He's outside vexed. Why? His dad, son, what's wrong? All these years I served you, dad. Man, I've been faithful. Man, listen, I, I never took the inheritance and wasted. I didn't bring shame on our family. You saw on Facebook what he's been doing all these years. Man, I've never done that. He said, I've worked hard for you. I've obeyed your commandments. He says, and all this time, you never gave me a kid. Are you serious? His dad looks at him, son, what do you mean? Everything I have is yours to take. You mean to tell me you've been working, just waiting for me to give you what's already yours? Amen. There's a lot of Christians like that. Come on. They're mad. Other people are coming to church testifying. Oh man, this one. And I got a raise. No raise. <laughs> Have you asked? Come on. Have you tried to push some doors open? See, what happens if we're not careful, <clears throat> we start looking for only open doors. And what happens is, the devil will open some doors for you. Yep. If that's your strategy for living, you'll find yourself a place you'll never need to be. That's right, man. Well, I, I, the door is wide open, so I just walk. Because all you do, you're looking for open doors and what's going to be given to you. See, it's, the issue is not whether or not the door is open or closed. The issue is whether it's the will of God. Come yeah. on. And if it's the will of God, man, hey, you tear down every door in your way. <laughs> I'm going to close with one scripture, John 20, verse 19. Then the same day of evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them, said, Peace be unto you. When Jesus resurrected, the disciples are in the upper room, all the doors are shut and locked. And they looked up and Jesus was there. What in the world? Jesus, where you come from? Mm -hmm. That scripture tells us that closed doors ain't no problem for our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah, it's right, man. Amen. Therefore, it should be no problem for us. Amen. And I want to challenge you this first night of revival. Let's leave this place with a tenacity. God, I'm not going to just keep waiting. God, I'm going to push some doors open. I want to make sure it's your will first. And when I know that, hey, hey, nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to have some take in me. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to bow your heads with me all across this room. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to dismiss. So appreciate you being here tonight. So appreciate your presence. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, listen, God knows intricately everything that's transpiring in our lives. He knows the circumstance of your life.
he wants to give you when you can never obtain. But God so loved the world that he gave it. He's the best giver. He freely gives. And there are things that no matter how strong you are, no matter how much willpower, you can never obtain without God. And the first thing is forgiveness. And as heads about and eyes are closed in this building, listen, God is reaching out to you. Forgiveness. He'll forgive you if you'll ask. If you just say, God, listen, please, would you forgive me? I need to be forgiven. Oh, there's no greater feeling in all of life than to be forgiven. That's available to every one of us in this place. Now, maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. God's dealing with you about your life. You say, Pastor, you don't know me. I, I, I've done some things. Hey, we've all done some things. Hey, none of us deserve it. But God loves us. And this morning in this place, or this evening, you're here and you say, I, I want that. I want to be forgiven. If that's you, just lift up your head all across this building. You never prayed this prayer. And you've never received Christ as your Savior. But you realize, I need Jesus. Would you lift your head? Just lift it up. Put it down. Anyone at all? All across this building. God speaking to you. Just lift it up. Put it down. Maybe you backslid. Maybe at one time you were living for God, but you drifted away. Life had just kind of caught you up and you, you find yourself so far away from God. You don't even really have a desire for the things of God, but, but you find yourself in this church building because God's brought you here. Would you lift your hand? Anyone at all who want to pray for you? There are Christians here tonight. There are people here that you've been sitting outside of a closed door waiting and hoping and praying turn into years, you become more and more disgruntled. You feel like God's forgotten about you. You feel like a second-rate citizen in this kingdom. And as days go by, the devil's lying to you. All you got to do is push. All you have to do is push. There's open doors and opportunities that God has. Listen, they await you. If you'll just push. And there are people here that you shied away from conflict and struggle because you bought into that lie. No, no, if it's God's will, he'll make it happen. And while you're waiting on God, God's waiting on you. We're going to open these altars. And I want you just to find a place to pray. This isn't about the person next to you. This is about you and your life. There's opportunities that God has put in place for you. And if you're going to receive all that God has for you, you've got to shake yourself to it. You've got to shake off self-pity. Silence the lies of the enemy, making you think that you don't deserve or, or that you're some second-rate sinner. You're not your child of the living God. God hasn't forgotten about you. You need to come to this altar. Your prayer is in God. You empower me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me some tenacity of heart. Help me to be a taker. Amen. We're going to stand. I want you to come find a place to pray. Let God speak to you personally. Let God minister to you personally, right where you live. Hallelujah. Let's worship God as, as these altars are open. Amen.
like this. I don't want to be like this. And there's things you don't want to be. Listen, God says, don't worry. Listen, God's got you. And God's going to challenge you. He's going to challenge you upward. It's like a personal trainer. You know, without a personal trainer, we, we never fulfill our, our potential. We, we, we will always stop short. I can't do that. Man. I'm tired. Man. No, you can do one more. No, man, I'm tired. You can, and and they, they force you. And, and, and what happens is in the process, you become stronger. You become the very person you want to be. That's what God's going to do with you. And I want to challenge you. Don't, don't be intimidated by struggle and conflict. I'm not saying go out and look for it, but, but, but don't allow things being a little bit difficult to make you think God doesn't want you to have certain things. Okay? Listen, there's some things God wants you to have. He's got them in place, and, and, and he's been waiting for you. And all you have to do is God's not asking you to do what you can't do. He's asking you to do what he knows you can do. So, so don't think, well, if I, could, if I had this, I would be there. No, no, listen. You'll be amazed at what God has for you. 
I want to pray for you, can I? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray your hand of grace, God. Lord, move supernaturally over this life, Lord, I plead your blood. I renounce the strategies of the enemy and the will of the enemy. Lord, I speak your will over this life. God, you know the yearnings and the desires and even the fears. Lord, I pray you empower him and strengthen him. I come against fear and anxiety and worry. Lord, I come against the feeling of not being adequate. Lord, I pray that you touch him and you cause him to realize that through you, God, all things are possible, Lord. Father, you give him a confidence and a boldness, Lord to fulfill your will. Lord, I speak your destiny over his life in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to turn it back you, over Lord. to Pastor. Amen. Oh, my God. Amen. You know what I really uh, love about that message is it's almost that we're seeing a whole generation that no longer is willing to take what is theirs. They're just saying, give me, give me, give me. And this is the lie that this generation is swallowing right now. We will give you free schooling. We will give you free health care. We will give you free, 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 free. And what happens is something inside of you dies. There used to be a spirit that says, ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country. And young men rose up and says, if we will go defend our country. And it's like that is dying, but greater than that, that spirit is dying in the church. And God is calling men to rise up, men and women, and say, we will take the kingdom. We will take the promised land. It is our church. We're standing right on the brink of it. And God is saying, are you going to take it? Or are you going to wander around at Walmart for the rest of your life? <laughs> Amen. We're not going to wander around the desert. We're going to wander around the Walmart. God is saying, what are you going to do? We're going to take it, church. Amen. We're going to take it. Amen. It's okay to be a taker tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this word. We ask your blessing upon each and every person. That is here, those that are watching, God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit and that you would put a fight in us, oh God, that we would take what is ours. We thank you for the wonderful things you are going to do even this week, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. You are dismissed. So come back tomorrow, amen, for service. Love unfailing.